Welcome to WBC Online. My name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors here at Wollongong Baptist. I'm so pleased you could come and join me today. Uh, if you're a visitor and you're just curious checking us out, so good to have you. Or if you're a regular member of WBC, it's great to have you back. Uh, we're here at church in our new digs uh, because this week we're actually kicking off a new series, a series in the book of 1 John, and we're going to be studying 1 John together over the course of the next eight weeks or so. I'm really looking forward to getting stuck into 1 John with you because 1 John is an incredible little book. Uh, It's a book which has some of the most beautiful and encouraging words in maybe the whole of the Bible. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. See what great love the Father has lavished upon us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. How about 1 John chapter 4, verse 10? This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Uh, 1 John is packed with these gems. Uh, that encapsulate the truth of the gospel, that God has made his love known to us by sending his son, Jesus Christ. It's going to be so good to reflect on some of those wonderful encapsulations of the gospel over this term. As we read 1 John, though, we're going to discover, actually, that the book is not all there designed to encourage us. Actually, part of John's purpose is to challenge us. And so we are going to read time and time again throughout this book, uh, John describing what the Christian life is to look like. And for us, the task is going to be, well, do we measure up to this description of the Christian life? Is that how we're living? Are we those people who truly know and love and obey Jesus? Uh, This week, we're going to be looking at 1 John chapter 1. And in our passage this week, John is going to write, If we claim to have fellowship with him, with God, and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. John is going to be challenging us like that week after week. And so for us, as we go through this series, there's going to be a little bit of soul searching that's going to need to happen, some reflection. And so we hope that this sermon series will be an occasion for you to look at your own life, to bear your heart and your soul before the Lord and to open it to him and to the light of the gospel. Uh, As much as we are going to be challenged as we read 1 John, John's actually pretty clear about the purpose why he wrote the book, and it's good for us to be aware of that as we begin this journey. John tells us in chapter 5, verse 13, exactly why he wrote this book. He said, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. John's purpose in putting this letter together is for Christians to have certainty and assurance that they do indeed have eternal life. And so hopefully that will be our experience as we study the book together. Coming away from these eight weeks more sure, more certain about where we stand now in Christ. I think we're going to need God's help for that journey. So we pray with me as we begin, and let's ask for God to, to make this true for us. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your love for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that you have made your love known by sending Jesus into the world, by laying down your life for your enemies, for us. Thank you that In Christ, we can be called your beloved children. What a privilege and an honor that is, Father. Please, would you teach us as we study this little letter together, this term. Teach us what it looks like to love and to follow the Lord Jesus. Help us to have the assurance and the certainty that you want us to have, knowing that we do indeed have eternal life. We ask that your spirit would be at work in us over the course of this term confirming that truth which we do know, Father. 
that Jesus is Lord, that forgiveness is found in him, and that eternity is sure when we put our trust in him. So please teach us, grow us, strengthen us this term, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we have called this series Love Made Known, and uh, hopefully some of you by now have already picked up your new series handbook. Uh, this little handbook is your guide for the course of this series, space for you to write sermon notes and reflections. Home group studies are going to be in there as well. Your home group leader should have already picked up a bunch of these for you if you're in a home group. If you're not in a home group, what are you doing? Uh, you should really join one. You know that we often say that the, the best time to join a home group is now. It's not quite true. Uh, the best time to join a home group would really be at the start of the year, but that option's not available to you. So if you're not in a home group, the second best time to join is now. And if you join, you can get your hands on one of these. Uh, if you'd like one of these and you're not in a home group anyway, come down to the church and pick them up. They're available from the office. We'd love to give you one as well. Uh, the other thing that's coming up that we'd love to let you know about is a special women's event coming up in just a few weeks' time on Saturday the 31st of October. It's going to be an afternoon spent in the book of Philippians. There's going to be some talks, some workshops, some live music, some book reviews, some testimonies. A really encouraging afternoon has been planned for the women of WBC to come along and to be refreshed by God's word. Uh, you do need to register for this event. Uh, and so tomorrow, Monday, there will be an email going out to all of the women in our church that we have on our database asking you to register online. Now, if you don't receive that email, that's okay. You can still come along. Just go to the church website tomorrow and there'll be a link on the front page there where you can register as well. Uh, we'll be reminding you about this over the coming weeks so you'll have more opportunities, but don't sleep on it because places are limited to the capacity of our auditorium under these current guidelines of about 60 people. Uh, so first come, best dressed. Well, over the course of this series, we've planned some great stuff to share with you. Uh, starting this week, every other week, we're going to be getting a chance to meet one of the members of our church. Uh, and this week, I want to introduce to you my new friend, Clayton. We're going to spend a few minutes hearing a little bit about him and his story. And then after that, we're going to sing. So my name's Clayton Ryan, and I'm married to Melissa, and we don't have any children, but we have two crazy poodles, uh, Max and Buddy, and we have recently returned from living overseas for 16 years, now, eight years in London, and the last eight years as missionaries in the Czech Republic, serving international students. And we've just returned, we've served our time in quarantine, and we've been released uh, into freedom for the last three weeks and we've just moved into Mangerton and yeah looking forward to getting to to know people and meet people here at WBC. So we've actually been coming to WBC for about four and a half months now maybe slightly longer uh, but about three three and a half months of those have been uh, from the Czech Republic and so we've been joining in online and watching uh, over our breakfast before we go to church in the Czech Republic and then we came to Australia and for two weeks we were part of WBC from a hotel room in Sydney in quarantine and on being released we've been joining online and joining the Zoom meetings afterwards and the first time we actually went to church here was a couple of weeks ago when we had the first in-person service. So four and a half months, but only been to church once um, in the building. But we've been able to get to know people through the Zoom meetings after the online service, which has been fantastic. And um, a couple of people from there have called us and we've you know, gone for drives, had coffee, had a meal. And the men's morning walk was a good place to meet people. And the prayer and praise evening uh, was a great time to meet people as well. So we're really looking forward to getting to meet more and more people um, as restrictions start to ease. So I think I was probably like many uh, people. I didn't grow up in a Christian household. 
uh, strangely, and obviously now I know this is God working behind the scenes. My parents sent me to Sunday school. Um, they wouldn't go, and we didn't go to church. They would drop me off and pick me up afterwards, and I didn't become a Christian through that, uh, but I think that was enough to let me know that there was always a God. Uh, but to be honest, he was completely irrelevant uh, to me and everything I did and everything I thought. And so I just went through life um, doing what I wanted to do through high school, university, and moved to Sydney after university to start work and you know, really enjoyed uh, living the non-Christian life. Um, and then one day my friend and I were having lunch and we said we really should find out about Christianity uh, we need to look into it more because we need to know why it's false. And strange thing to do, uh, but that's what we wanted to do. And you know, in God's good timing, um, he'd put the right friends in my path at the right time. And within a couple of weeks of my friend and I saying that, they invited me to a talk um, in town. It was for people who were working in the city, in Sydney, held by the City Bible Forum. And if you're old enough to have the privilege of hearing uh, Chapo, uh, John Chapman speaking. Uh, he was the speaker of the day. And it was one of those things that I have no idea when I think back what he spoke about, what passage he read, um, any particular words of wisdom or anything he said. But I do remember that when he read the Bible, it was the first time I'd ever heard the Bible read and not being bored off my brain. Uh, the words just jumped off the page. And when he spoke, he spoke about that passage and it actually made sense and sounded like actually this was something I probably should look into a bit further. But I didn't become a Christian after that and wasn't interested in becoming a Christian at all. But my friends encouraged me to go to church, which I did, which was a really good church um, in the city. But I kept hanging around after church to ask questions and strangely, no one would talk to me. Um, I don't know if that was me or something, but yeah, I had questions, but no one would answer them um, or even let me ask them. So I was ready to give up then, but my friend's like, no, 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 we'll find you another church. So we did. I uh, went to St. Matthias Church in East Sydney, and that was just a great um, community there of people who loved Jesus, but loved people as well. So I wasn't a project to them. Uh, they befriended me and very, very patiently put up with my stubbornness and my ridiculous questions for about another year and a half. Um, I don't know when I became a Christian at that point, but it was after a year and a half in a series of Ecclesiastes of really six weeks of really depressing sermons about everything is worthless and chasing after the wind. And then finally that last one where everything makes sense that unless everything is going in the direction of God, then there's just no point doing anything. And that was probably not really the moment I believed, but I think the moment I didn't have any more doubts. And so, yeah, from that, there's been huge changes uh, from there. So I've gone from a, you know, an accountant in the city, non-Christian, to a missionary in the Czech Republic. So if you want to know more about that, um, all I charge for that is a coffee, and I'll probably end up paying for that at the end anyway. It doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, give me a call, and let's go and chat. But I'd also like to encourage everyone, you know, Christianity Explored is going on now. So I was so not living the Christian life, or even looking like someone who might be saved. Uh, but friends invited me, and I guess they took the bold step of bringing me along to a talk, of opening up the Bible. I then went to a Simply Christianity course, which, you know, for those of us who are old enough to know what it's like before technology, uh, when you have no videos or DVDs to do a, a Christianity Explored course, that's what we did. And then it was just patiently just reading through the Bible, um, hearing sermons, going to church. So I really encourage everyone to just speak to their friends, befriend them and invite them along we have no idea what's going on in their hearts and what God has already done uh, to prepare them uh, for that invitation. So, yeah, invite them along, Christianity Explored, um, or just read the Bible with them and open up uh, the Gospels. So, yeah, that's my testimony, and 
yeah, if anyone wants to know more, as I said, it's just a coffee.
1 John chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Well, I'm so glad that you can join us today as we kick off our new Term 4 series in 1 John. My name's Rod. I'm one of the pastors here at WBC. Let me pray for us now as we come to God's Word that we might uh, respond rightly to it. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us your Word. We thank you that it's living and active, that it judges even the thoughts and attitudes of our hearts that's sharper than a double-edged sword. And Lord, we pray, knowing that nothing is hidden from your sight, that everything is laid bare before you, that you might uh, challenge us afresh this morning, that you might comfort us too where needed as we start to look at this letter, which is on the one hand reassuring, uh, but on the other uh, deeply challenging for us. Uh, please be at work in us by your Spirit, this day we ask, in Christ's name. Amen. Well, secession is the act of withdrawing from an organization or especially a political entity. And there are literally hundreds of political examples of secession or breakaway micro-nations around the world today where groups of people have left their former nation. Now, closer to home here, secession movements have surfaced several times in Western Australia. Perhaps the most interesting is the Principal Principality of Hutt River. It had claimed to be an independent, sovereign state since 1970, but it was dissolved on the 3rd of August this year. Maybe you saw it uh, a couple of months ago when it was on the news, where it was wound up by Prince Graham amidst disputes with the Australian Taxation Office which was demanding that the Principality pay millions in unpaid back taxes across its 50-year history. Now, it was never formally acknowledged by the Commonwealth of Australia, or anyone else for that matter. It's just a large farming property, about 517 kilometres north of Perth. It was founded by Leonard George Cassley in response to a dispute with the WA government over wheat quotas. He claimed independence to avoid their rules and he styled himself as Royal Highness Prince Leonard of Hutt. Now, the Australian government has never taken any action. It just viewed it as nothing more than a private enterprise. 
But despite that, the principality has released a number of its own stamps, has its own currency, it produces passports. Prince Leonard has even made his own laws and had his own mail system. He even has a gift shop as tourists visit. You just got to love it. However, although the larrikin Australian in us thinks that all of that is funny, it's quite a serious thing to leave your prior group in some context. You know, if a group of believers go out from a church and leave because they want to redefine Jesus, you've got a major issue that needs to be addressed, particularly if those who have left the church are seeking to influence others, uh, con causing confusion. You see, such is the backdrop to the letter of 1 John. In 1 John 2 verses 19 and 26, we read, They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. And so the author John found it necessary to bolster the assurance of the Christians who had become confused. Now the purpose of the letter is summarized uh, right at the end of it in 1 John 5.13 where John says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. The false teachers were wolves in sheep's clothing but John's readers from this church that he had planted were the real deal, the genuine Christians who had eternal life. But that does beg the question, you know, what will genuine Christians be marked by? That's the question that I want us to consider today from our passage. What will genuine Christians be marked by? Now the first answer to that question is this. A right understanding of Jesus based on the eyewitness accounts. A right understanding of Jesus based on the eyewitness accounts. So notice again what John writes in the opening two verses. 1 John verses 1 and 2. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father, and has appeared to us. Well, we see firstly in these verses that John's teaching was based on eyewitness testimony. As we've noted, uh, John is trying to reassure his readers that they are holding to the truth. And so here he seeks to achieve that by strengthening the reader's commitment to what they already know. They need to hold to his teaching or proclamation about the word of life, which is a reference to Jesus here. And they're to do this because John is an eyewitness of Christ's life. Now the phrase, from the beginning, in verse 1, is very reminiscent of the opening to John's gospel. In the beginning was the word, John 1.1. 1, 1. But notice that in both introductions, Jesus is referred to as the word, or here in 1 John, the word of life. He is the Word in flesh, God the Son, walking among us. Now in verse 2, the phrase eternal life also refers to Jesus, who was with the Father before he took on flesh and came to earth. He is the one in whom eternal life is found, which is why Jesus offers eternal life to all those who put their trust in him, because he has it to give. And lastly, in verses 3 and 4, this proclamation is to ensure true fellowship. Notice again what John writes. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to you to make our joy complete. And so the reason for proclaiming what he had seen and heard was that the church may have continued fellowship with John. You know, it's the alternative to having fellowship with the breakaway group, the false teachers. And here in this context, fellowship means more than just a personal relationship with John. 
It's also a partnership with him in the work of proclaiming Jesus. See, Christian fellowship here springs from our fellowship with God the Father through a right understanding of Jesus Christ the Son. So those who broke away claimed to have fellowship with God the Father, but they had rejected the biblical Jesus who took on real flesh and yet who was also the eternal Son of God, both fully God and fully man. And in verse 4, this introduction of the letter concludes with John's reason for writing as he does, which seems a little odd as he talks about bringing his joy to himself, bringing it to a state of completion, completion, but it's because he feels responsible for his fellow believers and his joy can't be complete if he fears that they're in danger of turning from the truth. Now, as we apply this first point to ourselves, uh, we need to grasp that we cannot be listening to those who reject the authority of scriptures written down by the eyewitness apostles. And we can't be accepting those who reject that Jesus is fully God and fully man. Now, a few years ago, uh, I spoke with a middle-aged uh, couple who knocked on my door, uh, who were very polite, as I engaged them in conversation for about 15 minutes or so, um, all about eternal life and the Trinity. Now, they were Jehovah's Witnesses, or JWs for short. And for all their talk of loving the Bible, you know, they interpret the Bible according to what an elite group of their leaders say in America who publish their Watchtower magazine. They only believe the Bible in so much as it conforms to the teaching of this higher authority. They have rejected the apostolic gospel in favor of their own interpretation. And so we're not to listen to them and to those who reject the joint humanity and divinity of Jesus. Whether it's Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons or the Christadelphians or the Church of Scientology, all of these groups deny the full divinity of Jesus. And so they're all confusing groups, dangerous groups, because they present themselves largely as Christians and look for common ground with us. But you can't own the name of Christ and then deny who he says he is in the pages of Scripture. We must highlight the differences, because once a person denies the Bible's authority or denies Jesus, there is no true fellowship. And we don't help them or ourselves by pretending otherwise. I remember having an hour-long conversation with a young JW some years ago when I was living in Chatswood. It was a very cold winter's day. As we stood there at the door, I told him he was part of a cult, that his beliefs denied the Bible, that his group had only existed since 1876, but that their false beliefs had been held in one form or another since the time of Christ. Now, it was a hard conversation i tried to do it politely and in a way that might cause him to reconsider his views i'm sure i could have done better but anything else is not truthful and it's not truly loving that brings us to a second answer to our question of what is a genuine christian marked by secondly a right attitude towards sin a right attitude towards sin so notice again what the Apostle John writes in verses 5 to 7. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. See, the description here of God being light is contrasted with the equally strong truth that there is no darkness in God. Now, that last phrase in verse 5 could be literally translated, and darkness in him? No, not any at all. You know, the two are utterly incompatible. And a light is not only a frequent symbol of God's presence in the Bible, but also of his moral perfection. God is perfectly righteous, flawless in his holiness. And so light exposes what the darkness would hide. 
Now the implications of this for us are spelt out in verses 6 to 10 as John deals with three false attitudes towards sin that all start with the phrase, if we claim. So firstly, notice in verse 6, we cannot claim to know God or to have fellowship with him if we walk in darkness. See, such a claim would be false. Now, the idea of walking in this context indicates a persistent movement in a particular direction. We might call it a lifestyle, a settled pattern. You know, the proof of a genuine Christian who claims to know God is a holy life matching it. There's no possibility of compromising, of trying to have one foot, as it were, walking in the light of God and the other remaining in the darkness of the world. You know, a person who persists in sin cannot be in fellowship with God, John is saying. These two states are mutually exclusive. It's like trying to have one foot in a boat and the other foot on the riverbank. It cannot work. You know, the famous American author and writer, uh, Jerry Bridges, said, One day as I was reading 1 John, I realized that my personal life's objective regarding holiness was less than that of John's. He was saying, in effect, make it your aim not to sin. And as I thought about it, Bridges wrote, I realized that deep within my heart, my real aim was not to sin very much. Can you imagine, he says, a soldier going into battle with the aim of not getting hit very much? We're in a spiritual battle, you see, as we face our sin. Well, secondly, in verse 8, we cannot claim with regard to sin that we don't have a sinful nature. Or we're simply deceiving ourselves, John says, and the truth is not in us. Now, nobody wants to be self-deluded, uh, to believe something about ourselves that's just not true. But John says that's what we are if we think that we are not a sinner. So not only do we need to see persistent sin as incompatible with a claim to know God, secondly, we also need to acknowledge that we are fallen creatures, to grasp that we all, by nature, are sinners because we fall short of God's perfect standards. And to claim otherwise is not simply a lie, but it's to prove that we don't have any fellowship with God. We don't know God, John says. Now, this would include a person claiming you know, that they once had the sinful nature, but they've completely overcome it now, so that they have reached a higher plane you know, of sinless perfection. There's a story along those lines uh, regarding the famous Baptist preacher of the 19th century, Charles Spurgeon. Um, he was confronted by a man who claimed to be without sin, to have reached a, a new level so that he, he no longer sinned. He'd overcome his sinful nature. And intrigued, Spurgeon invited him home to his place for dinner. And during the dinner, Spurgeon picked up his glass of water and threw it in the man's face. Understandably, the visitor was highly indignant and expressed himself very forcefully through his evident anger. And Spurgeon replied, Ah, I see the old man within you is not dead. He had simply fainted and could be revived with a glass of water. Well, thirdly, in verse 10, another false claim. We cannot claim to have not sinned or we would be calling God a liar. In verse 8, the claim was, I am not a sinner. I don't have a sinful nature. Here in verse 10, it's more particularly, I haven't sinned. I've never spoken the wrong thing. I've never acted improperly. We've moved from the inward principle of the sinful nature to the outward symptoms that confirm our disease. And to deny any outward sinful actions or words is to not have God's word in us at all, says John. Now, perhaps having heard all of this, um, you're thinking, wow, you know, the standard is so high, perhaps this is causing you to lack assurance of your salvation rather than be reassured, as John says he is writing for us. But see, we need to grasp here that falling into sin is not our biggest problem. It's how we respond to that failure. You see, this side of heaven, we're going to constantly fall short of God's standard. We will continue to sin. The question is whether we will fall into the trap of ignoring 
or denying our sin or whether we will confess it. And this is why verse 9 is just so wonderful. The Apostle John acknowledges that believers are going to continue to struggle with sin. What God wants from us at that moment is a contrite heart. He can forgive us if we will admit our brokenness. This is true repentance. And it's hard for us because it's humbling. Look at the precious words of verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We need to acknowledge our continued need of the cleansing work of Christ through repentant prayer. And we need to be assured that when we do so, God will remove our sins. He will completely purify us. Now, if we ignore sin in our life and do not ask for this pardon, then we'll remain stunted as a Christian, unable to grow in godliness as God intended. But if we will confess our sin, he will forgive us again and again. You see, with God, there is always space for grace, his undeserved favor to us. That brings us to a final answer to what marks a genuine Christian. Thirdly, a right understanding of Christ's payment for sin. A right understanding of Christ's payment for sin. Notice the final two verses in our passage. 1 John 2 verses 1 and 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Well, here we see the grounds of God extending forgiveness to those who repent in verse 9. And it's Christ's finished work on the cross that allows us to be purified. This is something that John had already alluded to in passing in verse 7 of chapter 1, but he explains it further here. We have a saviour who has turned away God's rightful anger against sin. This is the meaning of the Greek word helasmos, which is translated atoning sacrifice or propitiation in verse 2. See, Jesus died as our substitute and his blood shed for us allows God's anger and just punishment not to fall on us, to be turned away from us, to fall on his son. The justice of God was satisfied And he can therefore forgive us our debt because it's been met by Jesus. Jesus died in our place. Anna Sophia Tura was one of 21 children born in northern Finland. Uh, Her half-sister Maria was married and living in Ohio by the time she was 18. And after a visit from her sister and her husband, John, they enticed Anna to come to America. Well, when she boarded the Titanic in Southampton, England, she was 18 years old, and late on that fateful Sunday night, April 14, 1912, she felt a shudder and a shake. And soon afterward, her roommate's brother knocked on the door and told them that something was wrong. They should put on their warm clothing and their life jackets and make their way up. And so their little group dressed, headed up to the upper decks. And a sailor eventually picked Anna up and put her into the second last lifeboat to be launched. In fact, it seemed that she had taken his place because he remained on the ship while she was the last one to get on that boat. She heard loud explosions as the light went out and the Titanic went under in the minutes that followed. And every year on the anniversary, she would sit her children down to tell them the story again. And she was just so thankful that God had saved her through a sailor whose seat she was given. She would always say to them, I just can't understand why God would save a poor Finnish girl like me. But you see, even greater is our eternal salvation in Christ, who gave his life that we might live who laid it down so that we could have true forgiveness and full fellowship with God the Father. 
more than that, we're told in verse 1 of chapter 2 that our fellowship with God includes Jesus being our advocate at his right hand. If we know his payment, he speaks on our behalf in our defense. And so our assurance of forgiveness and ongoing growth is found in Christ's perfection. And it's not the vain hope of our perfection in this life that proves our genuineness, nor ignoring or denying our sin or redefining it. No, I think John Newton, the converted slave trader who wrote the famous hymn Amazing Grace, put it best when he said, I am not what I ought to be, but I am not what I once was, and it is by the grace of God that I am what I am. What are the marks of a genuine Christian? Well, it's a right understanding of Jesus, that he is fully God, fully man, a right attitude towards sin, and a right understanding of Christ's payment for that sin. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that though you call us, if we have come to trust in your Son Jesus, to a life of holiness, of living in a way that reflects that you are our Master, we thank you that you have made allowance for our fallen nature, that there is ongoing forgiveness of sin as we come before you, confessing our need. Lord, we thank you that we can be completely reassured because the price has been paid by our wonderful Saviour, the Lord Jesus. Lord, help us to see that he is both fully God and fully man, the one who atoned for our sin and therefore stands as our advocate as we strive to grow in godliness day by day. Help us to see that this is what should mark us out as someone who is seeking to follow Jesus, to be his disciple. And we pray this in his name. Amen. How deep the Father's love Beyond all measure That he should give his only son To make a wretch his treasure How great the pain of searing loss The fire turns his face away as wounds which mother chose and bring many sons to i
secret. I am a sinner and I got a hunch that you might just be too. So isn't it good news for sinners like us that there is an advocate with the Father, one who speaks in our defense to God Almighty, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, the one who atones for our sins by laying down his perfect life so that we can go free. Isn't that good news, friends? That is such good news that I hope you want to tell people about it. I hope you want to talk about it. I hope you want to praise God for it. So let me encourage you as we come to the end of today's service, not to stay quiet about this good news. Why don't you start a conversation with someone about it today? In the series handbooks, there are some reflection questions written there for you at the end of each sermon space. These would be questions that would be great questions for you to ask somebody today. And hey, if you're watching this service with a group of people in someone's home, what better place to begin a conversation right now than these questions? What was the main message you heard today? What is one thing that challenged or encouraged you? And what difference will that make to your week? Have a conversation with someone today. Even if you're not in someone's home watching this together, why don't you pick up the phone and call someone uh, from the WBC family and encourage them with a conversation around those kind of things. Let me pray for us as we finish. Kind and loving and merciful God, we know the darkness of our own hearts. We know the depths of our sin. We dare not be people who claim to be without sin because we know the reality of our own hearts. And so, Lord, when we sin, we thank you that we have someone who speaks on our behalf, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that you look at him in his sinless perfection and you count us as righteous. Great God, we pray that you would help us to rest in that incredible truth this week. We ask for the sake of your glorious Son's name. Amen. See you next week.